The cooler evening winds of autumn in Stellenbosch had just begun to stir up the sandy road as he pulls his rental car out of the wine estate and onto the road. The blue Toyota disappears into the distance, heading toward unknown danger. And the next time the car and its driver are seen, the world is suddenly a very different place for the Yonkate family. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 132, The Murder of Klaus Jonkheit. This episode is sponsored by Ring. Make upgrading your home security a priority this October. All Ring devices, cameras, video doorbells and alarm systems take less than 15 minutes to install. Ring products allow you to monitor every corner of your home from your phone, no matter where you are. With cameras in strategic locations, you can create a ring of security around your property. Keep an eye on what's most valuable to you, because with Ring, you're always home. A huge thank you to Ring for sponsoring this episode of True Crime South Africa. Since 2019, True Crime South Africa has been telling the stories of the victims of violent crime in South Africa. The podcast is independent. That means no big or even little corporates fund it. And that's just the way I like it. And... It's the only independent podcast in South Africa that consistently charts in the top 10. Keeping a podcast like this going is time-consuming, and for the most part, it remains a one-woman process. It's me. I'm the one woman. You? Yes, you. Are the reason this podcast continues to flourish and help bring in tips on missing person and cold cases. If you'd like to help keep the show running, please consider supporting our sponsors, signing up to Patreon or PayPal, follow the show on the socials, as the kids say, and share it with your fellow partners in crime. You can find our social links and learn more about our sponsors at True Crime South Africa forward slash donate. Shout out to this week's Patreon and PayPal superstars. A huge thank you goes out to Marnie Strauss, Robert Blaine, Vidat Peterson, Ozolo Mofukeng, and Banana Peel for your support on Patreon. Thank you so much, everyone. Patreon supporters get one additional exclusive episode a month, a shout out on the pod, and other exclusive contents, including Q&As with me as and when it's available. It's a minimum of $1 a month. I think you should do it. Please. And thank you. Keba. So many crimes in South Africa are sadly perfect examples of how very ordinary days can go horribly wrong in seconds and result in absolutely unnecessary loss of life. And today's case certainly fits that category. In addition, in so many cases, we never really get the full truth and the family members of the victim are left to somehow make do with a patched-together possibility police and prosecutors can build up from evidence. Occasionally, years after a crime has been committed and the perpetrator is up for parole, they may provide answers to questions in a victim-offender dialogue or VOD, but that rarely makes up for the time families spend wondering and wishing in between. Sadly, most never get the answers they seek because perpetrators could not be bothered to do so. It is their element of control. No matter how much that may continue to perpetuate the circle of trauma. In researching this episode, I used a chapter from the book Stellenbosch Murder Town by Julian Janssen, a judgment from the case relating to the appeal, the sentencing document, and several media articles. And so let's get into episode 132, The Murder of Klaus Jonkheit. 
The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counseling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Klaas Jonkate was born in 1961. After matriculating, Klaas started his academic journey, which would continue on for most of his life. He would eventually earn an honours degree in business economics, a master's degree in business management, and a doctorate in consumer behaviour. Klaas soon established himself as a well-respected consumer psychologist and marketing strategist. He worked at Cadbury Schweppes, as well as FCB South Africa, before starting his own business, the Consumer Psychology Lab, with his wife Liesel in 2005. The couple lived in Parkhurst, Johannesburg, but Klaas travelled regularly as he was in demand as a speaker across the country and lectured at various universities. Although Klaas had already achieved a significant amount in his time, he still had many dreams and aspirations for the time ahead. One specific dream he had was to travel across Africa in his Pajero, and his love for Harley-Davidson motorcycles was legendary. In 2008, Klaas started working on a new research project for Media24, which focused on how the Burger newspaper should be redesigned to its best effect. And as 2009 came around, he was concluding research on the consumer habits of the various coloured communities around South Africa. In May 2009, Klaas was invited to speak and fill a role as a judge at a conference being held in Stellenbosch, Western Cape. The conference itself was two days long, starting on the 27th of May and ending on the 29th with a banquet dinner. On the 27th of May, Klaas arrived at Cape Town Airport. He proceeded to Avis rent a car, where he picked up a rental vehicle he'd booked, a blue Toyota Yaris. From there, he drove the half an hour trip to Stellenbosch, where the conference organizers had booked him into the Protea Hotel in Techno Park. The hotel was just a 10-minute drive from Speer Wine Estate, where the conference was being held. On the 27th, 28th and 29th, Klaas attended the conference and carried out the duties he'd been asked to. On Friday the 29th, the conference activities concluded at 3pm and delegates were asked to be back at Speer by 7pm for the banquet dinner, which would close out the conference. Fellow delegates watched Klaas leave the conference centre around 3pm. He would have been heading out to his hotel to shower and get ready for the dinner. When the banquet dinner started at 7pm though, Klaas was not there. He was not just running late, as his colleagues initially thought. As the hours ticked by, he simply didn't arrive. Those who knew him well tried his cell phone but he didn't answer, and they eventually thought that perhaps he'd just been too tired to attend the dinner and decided just to get an early night as he had an 8am flight the next morning back to Johannesburg. One or two people at the dinner did send Klaas's wife Liesel messages, and when she also could not get hold of her husband, she started to become concerned. Over the next few hours, Liesel would try everything she could to find out where her husband was. She called Stellenbosch Police Station, and officers informed her that she would either need to go in person or have someone do so in her stead. They provisionally took her report and said they would still need someone to come in personally, but they would keep an eye out for Klaas. By the next morning, though, when he was still not responding and his 8am flight out of Cape Town left without him on board, Liesel knew something was very wrong. She booked her own flight into Cape Town, instinctively knowing that she needed to go there herself to try and find Klaas. On Saturday afternoon, Francie Heathcote was walking in Four, Stellenbosch, near the St. Paul's Anglican Church, when a man came rushing toward him, his face ashen. He told him he just walked through the back of the churchyard and discovered a dead body. Francie followed the man, half believing he must be mistaken, but soon realised he was not. 
There, laying in the sand, face down, was the body of a man. Although it was clear that someone had attempted to burn the man's body, the burns were mostly superficial, and the fire appeared to have burned itself out. The victim's top items of clothing were shredded by the fire, and bizarrely, two bank cards were laying on the victim's back and had melted there. The man's jeans were on his body and fastened as they should be, but they were pulled slightly down. There were two small holes, one on either side of the victim's head. Nearby, an empty wallet lay discarded in the grass, along with a receipt from Protea Hotel, Techno Park. Francie Heathcote called police. The first two officers to respond to the scene were Detective Constable Stephen Adams and Detective Constable Marlon Apollos. Apollos, along with his partner at the time, Inspector George Ainsley, would become the investigating officers on the case. Apollos and Ainsley would go on to be dubbed the A-Team, as they would solve several high-profile cases in Stellenbosch. When police arrived on the scene, their initial thoughts immediately went to the man from Johannesburg, whose wife had reported him missing. Looking more closely at the man's body, they saw the holes on either side of his head and preliminarily believed that these were gunshot wounds. There was also an abrasion on the victim's cheek. Although they would have to carry out a proper identification through some of the items at the scene, including the victim's clothing and his wallet, the officers were able to get a tentative confirmation from Liesel Yonkate that these items had indeed belonged to her husband. Although the missing persons report had already asked officers to be on the lookout for the rental car class was driving, with this tentative identification, they asked their office dispatcher to ensure that every officer in the area had the vehicle's details, as it was now possible that murder suspects were driving it. But they would not have to wait very long. Police were still processing the first scene when a call came in to report a burned-out car just a few hundred metres across the road in some bushes. The vehicle had sustained significant damage from what seemed to have been a fire set on purpose and was little more than a shell. But in the bushes around the car, police found a Toyota badge and another receipt similar to the one at the scene where the body had been found from Protea Hotel, Techno Park. As the majority of the burns were on the back of the victim's body, it was possible for him to be identified, and sadly, Liesel Yonkate confirmed that the victim was indeed her husband, 48-year-old Klaus Yonkate. Klaus's wife had the terrible job of having to inform her elderly parents-in-law that their son had been viciously murdered. Klaus's rental car had clearly been stripped of several items before it was set alight, and items such as the radio and spare wheel were added to the list of things that were missing, which included Klaus's watch, which was worth close to 15,000 rand, his white gold wedding ring, and his cell phone. First thing on Monday morning, Klaus's autopsy was carried out in the hopes that additional information could be gleaned from his injuries. A ballistics technician also attended the autopsy, as they hoped they may find the bullets still lodged inside Klaus's head, and this could be valuable evidence if a firearm was recovered with any suspects. Although the pathologist was able to confirm that Klaus had indeed died from a single gunshot wound to the head, the bullet was not lodged anywhere in his body. Police would also go on to search the entire shell of the vehicle in the hopes that they could find it there but no bullets was ever recovered. The pathologist was able to say, though, that the gunshot wound had been caused by a relatively small caliber weapon. The entrance wound on the right-hand temple of Klaus's head measured 15 millimeters by 12 millimeters, and the exit wound on the left-hand side, just behind his ear, was larger, as is normal with exit wounds, and measured 25 millimeters by 20 millimeters. From experience, it seemed the victim had likely been shot with a 9mm. The trajectory of the bullet was downward, 
indicating the class may have been laying on the ground or another surface when he was shot. The gun had not been held up against his head when it was fired, but it was a distance away. Again, painting the picture of a shooter standing over the man who was perhaps laying on his side and aiming the gun at the right temple. When the pathologist checked Class's clothing for evidence, she found that his jacket had a hole through it, which matched up closely to the bullet wound in his head. Police believed the jacket had been held over his head when the bullet was fired. Either Class had done this as some last form of desperate final protection, or the shooter had ordered him to cover his head, perhaps to avoid either looking at his victim as he killed him, or as a way to trick Class into thinking he was going to leave him alone if he just covered his face. Alternatively, it may have just been a way to avoid blood splatter getting on their clothing. The laceration on Class's cheek also told a story. It had been sustained prior to the gunshot, while Class was alive, and the pathologist found pieces of sand embedded in the wound, indicating that the injury had been sustained while Class was being dragged across the sandy area where he'd been found. Perhaps the only small mercy was that the pathologist could say that the brain injury caused by the bullet was so catastrophic that Class would undoubtedly have either died immediately or within no more than a few minutes, and it would be unlikely he would have had any conscious awareness after he was shot. All in all, a pretty bleak image emerged from the autopsy and gave police a sense that they were dealing with a very cold-blooded killer. Detectives immediately put their focus on trying to track Class's cell phone. They knew it would be exchanging hands in the hours after the murder, and although it had been switched off, it could be switched back on at any time, and they wanted to be ready to use that when it happened to track their killers. When they started tracking the cell phone on the Sunday after Class's body was discovered, the phone continued to indicate that its last known position was a cell phone tower at a nearby military base, but this didn't narrow it down for police nearly enough. Then on Monday, with the assistance of the cell phone provider, police sent a ping to Class's cell phone, and within minutes, they had the precise location a house in an area called Stratford Green, which was not far from the murder scene. The house belonged to a pastor called David Smith. Intel told Apollos and Ainsley that the pastor lived there with his wife Portia and several of his adult children. The detectives were able to secure an emergency search warrant for the premises and rushed out to the house. On arrival, the officers were let into the house by David Smith after showing him the search warrant. In the lounge, they found one of the Smith's adult daughters. The woman had a cell phone in her hand when the officers walked in, and when she saw them, she pushed the cell phone down into the cushions of the couch. The officers noted this and proceeded to start their searches upstairs, asking first to be taken to the bedrooms of the Smith's sons. There, in one bedroom, they located a car radio and a car wheel. The officers would also find various other car parts hidden in the bedrooms, a 9mm parabellum pistol and ammunition which would fit this weapon as well as ammunition for an R5 rifle. David Smith confirmed that the pistol was licensed to him, but it was not found in his safe but rather in the bedroom used by one of his sons. Collecting all of this evidence, the officers headed back downstairs to question the daughter sitting on the couch. They asked her for the cell phone she'd pushed down into the cushions, and although she initially claimed it was her phone and she'd had it for a long time, the phone was the same brand and model as the one that belonged to Klaus Jonkate, and they told the woman that they didn't believe her. Putting more and more pressure on her, she eventually admitted where she'd got the phone from. She said that her brothers Wayne, 23, and Elton, 22, had brought the phone home. 
They'd tried to sell the phone to someone, but the buyer hadn't been happy with it, so she'd swapped her own cell phone for this phone. The officers opened up the phone and checked the IMEI number, which matched what they'd been given by Klaus Jonkate's cell phone service provider. Then Wayne and Elton were brought in to speak with the officers. Immediately, they noted that Wayne had burn marks on his face, and with all of the stolen items being in the house at the time, as well as the cell phone of the victim, both Wayne and Elton were arrested in connection with the murder of Klaus Jonkate. Two other men would also be arrested at that time for also being in the possession of some of the parts that had been stripped from Klaus's rental car, but those two men would be released without charge soon after. Wayne and Elton, though, were going nowhere. The brothers' shoes were confiscated, and a pair of jeans was also taken in as evidence. Elton Smith began to share a version of events with police almost immediately. He claimed that on Friday the 29th he'd been walking in 4 around 7pm when he saw a white man in a blue car picking up a sex worker on the side of the road and then driving into the bushes. He claimed that he'd heard a gunshot and went to investigate, thinking that perhaps the man had shot the sex worker, but she ran out onto the road, fleeing the scene, and when he approached the car, he saw that there was another man there one he claimed he knew to be a pimp in the area and who went by the street name Cess, or Bobby. He claimed that Cess was holding a gun and had shot the white man who was lying face down in the sand next to the car. Elton claimed that Cess had given him 300 rand, a ring and the cell phone and instructed him to take the blue Toyota Yaris and burn it elsewhere. He claimed he'd followed instructions and that was the last time he'd seen Cess. Elton claimed that from there he'd gone to pick up his girlfriend and brother in the stolen car, but claimed he'd dropped them both back off before heading to the petrol station, purchasing petrol, driving the car to the spot where it was found, stripping it, dousing it in petrol, and then setting it alight. Elton said he was not able to give police a name for the sex worker, and also couldn't tell them where to find Cess. He insisted he'd had nothing to do with the murder. Police would conduct extensive searches looking for a man named Cess or Bobby, who worked as a pimp, as well as the sex worker Elton had described, but there was absolutely no trace of either such person. With the two men in custody, police went to the home of Elton's girlfriend, they asked her if she could give them a rundown of what had happened on Friday. The young woman said she was at the Smith's home on Friday with both Wayne and Elton until about 1pm when Elton left the house without telling them where he was going. Around 5pm she went to look for him but couldn't find him anywhere in the neighbourhood so she returned to the house. At 6.30pm Elton had returned to the house and instructed his brother to get a spade and a knife. Wayne apparently did as he was told and left with his brother. They returned within half an hour and Elton called her to come outside. There she found that he was driving a car she didn't recognise. She asked Elton for cigarettes and he told her to get into the car and they would go to the petrol station and get some. While they were there, the woman said she noticed that the car's window was smashed. She'd initially thought it was just rolled all the way down, but she noticed small pieces of glass sticking up from the frame. She asked Wayne whether the car was stolen, and he didn't reply. Elton came back to the car with her cigarettes, and she told him she wanted to go home as she was concerned that they were driving around in a stolen vehicle. Elton dropped her off at his parents' house, and the brothers left again. They returned an hour later, without the car, and Wayne had burns on his face. The woman confirmed that there was a man in the area who went by the name Cess, but his name was Marius and not Bobby, and she wasn't aware that he was involved in pimp work at all. As the Smith brothers remained in custody, officers started to dig into their backgrounds and soon struck gold. 
both Wayne and Elton worked at Spear Wine Estate as part-time cleaners. The road that led the brothers there was long and winding and littered with poor choices. Portia and David Smith had moved to Stratford Green 20 years before when their children were very young. They'd made the move as it was a safer place to raise their children, but as the years had passed, even their new neighbourhood had been overrun by drug dealers and gangsters. David had worked as a long-distance truck driver for a while when the children were young, but he'd become a pastor and then also worked as a supervisor at a construction company later on. The material needs of the family were always well were always taken care of, but David acknowledged that he'd perhaps not spent as much time as he could with the children because he was working to support them. Portia was a stay-at-home mom, and she was extremely protective of her children. In some aspects, it seemed she may have been too accommodating, and it would emerge that she'd allowed her sons to use her car without them having driver's licenses, and when Wayne and Alton had both become drug users in their teens, she'd allowed them to use drugs in the home rather than using on the street, presumably to ensure their safety, which is always a struggle for parents of those with substance use disorders. David's other son also struggled with substance abuse and had been an alcoholic for several years. Wayne and Alton had been very close throughout their lives, likely due to being so close in age. Neither young man had finished school, with Wayne finishing grade 8 and Alton grade 9. The major reasons for the boys leaving school so early was their disruptive behaviour. They were expelled from most of the schools in their area, and eventually, after having no more viable options, both ended their school careers and started working. When it came to work, though, neither young man seemed to have much more success in a single position, and although they were always employed in some respects, they were very often dismissed for poor timekeeping, dishonesty and drug use. It was clear that most of the money they made went toward their drug habits, and neither young man had made much progress in their lives to the positive by the time they were arrested. Rather, it was clear that especially Alton was on a deep downward spiral. In March 2009, just before the murder of Klaus Jonkate, Alton had been convicted of housebreaking and sentenced to six months in jail, which was suspended for three years. In June 2009, the brothers applied for bail. Wayne was still adamant that he played no role in the murder and had only followed his brother's instructions to help burn the vehicle. He said he hadn't known that there'd been a murder involved in the theft of the car. Alton's statement at his bail hearing was different from what he'd told police. He now said that he'd been smoking dacha at home that Friday and decided to go for a walk. He claimed he'd seen a woman on the path who he recognised as a sex worker and then stumbled upon the vehicle and saw the man he knew as Cess tampering with the radio in the car. He said the left-hand window of the vehicle was smashed, and he thought it was a robbery, and then Cess had threatened him and made him take the car. The judge immediately noticed that his version was different from what he told police, and asked him why he was changing his version. Elton claimed he couldn't remember what he told police, but his version in court at that time was the truth according to him. The judge denied bail for both brothers, saying that they were both clearly a flight risk. The state had an excellent prima facie case against them, and Elton was clearly either lying to police, lying in the court, or more likely both, as the truth does not change, and so his story should have been the same. When the trial started in Cape Town High Court a year later, Klaas's family had already transported his body back to Johannesburg and laid him to rest. But the trial would be a major part of their healing process. They needed to know what had really happened. From the evidence that was presented, it soon became clear that there was no sex worker or pimp involved in the incident. 
Elton had likely inserted those characters because his own girlfriend was a sex worker, so that may have been the first scenario that popped into his head. Rather than him having stumbled upon Klaas and his rental vehicle, the state put forward that Elton may have seen Klaas at Spear Wine Estate and noticed that he was not from Cape Town, perhaps even noticed the expense of watch he was wearing. It's believed that Elton left his home that day with full knowledge that the conference was ending around 3pm and that he'd taken his father's 9mm weapon with him and hijacked Klaas as he drove out of the estate. He likely then forced him into the passenger seat and drove the vehicle to the bushes behind the church where he proceeded to rob Klaas of whatever he could find on him. He likely then opened the passenger door and told Klaas to get out. Perhaps the terrified man didn't move fast enough for Elton's liking because it's believed he grabbed him by the legs and dragged him out and onto the ground. This is likely how his pants moved downward and when he sustained the abrasion on his cheek. Then, he either told Klaas to cover his face with the jacket, or Klaas had done so himself in fear, and Elton had fired one bullet into the side of Klaas's head. Elton had then gone back to his parents' house, where he picked up Wayne, a spade, and a knife. It's very likely that the brothers had intended to bury Klaas, but they probably underestimated how long it would take to dig a hole that would fit a human body, so they decided to attempt to burn Klaas instead. The burns on Wayne's face would likely have been from trying to burn Klaas's body and not the car, because it would be far more difficult to set a body alight and move away quickly enough than it would be a car. This, of course, could not be proven, but it is the most likely scenario. On the 7th of December 2010, the judge delivered her judgment in the matter. She found Elton Smith guilty of murder, robbery and illegal possession of a weapon and ammunition. She found Wayne Smith guilty of being an accessory to murder after the fact and the theft of the motor vehicle and other possessions. In February 2011, Elton Smith was handed down a life sentence plus 15 years for his crimes. Wayne Smith was sentenced to seven years for being an accessory to murder after the fact and six years for robbery. Elton's defense attorney attempted to immediately appeal on the basis that Elton's youth had not been sufficiently considered in sentencing, but this was turned down. The judge cited Elton's lifelong criminal activities his continued drug use in prison, and the fact that he joined a prison gang as factors that led her to believe that his youth had played no role in his crime. Despite being just 22 years old, she said, he was clearly already a hardened criminal who'd shown no remorse for his crimes or intention to rehabilitate himself. By the time you're listening to this podcast, Wayne Smith would have already served his sentence and been released. Elton Smith will be eligible for parole in 2034. Sadly, although the state was able to offer a pretty likely version of what had occurred that seems to match up with the evidence, Klaus's wife and family will never really know what happened. Whether or not that's been an impediment to their healing is often personal and differs from person to person. Without a doubt, though, Klaus's murder was horrifically unnecessary and completely avoidable. And I can't help but think about how creepy it is that the whole time that Klaus was attending that conference, he was probably being watched by Elton Smith. The young man, who had a far better start in life than many of his peers, whose parents saw to his every need, and who time and again decided that the easy way out was best. Klaus Jonkert had three days in Cape Town planned. He was going to fly in, spend time discussing the industry and research he was so passionate about, and then fly out. I have no doubt he kissed his wife goodbye 
before heading out to the airport with the full knowledge that he'd be back in three days. But Alton Smith decided otherwise. Maybe from the moment class arrived, he was being watched, singled out, and hunted. And he had absolutely no idea. Elton Smith decided that what he wanted was far more important, and any money he could get from hijacking the man would buy him drugs for the weekend. And of course, in his mind, this was far more valuable than leaving class to tell the tale. So he did what he'd always done in his 22 years on Earth. He took what he wanted and gave no consideration to the consequences. Class Jonkheit, rest gently. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on Spotify or the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Live Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.